Over the last 12 months, I've reviewed dozens of power adapters, everything from the cheapest 5 watt Amazon model all the way up to the latest 200 watt laptop chargers. From my testing, it's clear that they are not all created equal, and sometimes you aren't getting what you pay for. Given the variety of quality in these devices, I wanted to put together my top performers in each product category. I'll cover mobile phone, tablet, full-on laptop chargers, and show you what you're paying for. Specifically, we will take a look at the power quality, cost, size, and features of each adapter. I wanted to make this video for a while, so stick around as we dive into power adapters. If you are new here, I try to answer the question, which power adapter do I want to get? The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The performance is measured and compared to near competitors to see how each one stacks up. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my website or down in the description. Patreon is now live as well as the super button. Thanks to my current patrons. First, a little detail on some of the terminology. There are lots of features of modern power adapters. As we build out the mega comparison, there will be lots of terms companies use to describe power adapters. I am building up the terminology as the video proceeds. So first up is the output power you get from USB power adapters. This varies across port type and power level of the adapter. The smallest adapters, usually 15 watts or less, are only 5 volt devices. These are still compliant with the latest version of the USB Power Delivery 3.1 system, but only have that one mode of operation. These can be on a USB-A or a USB-C port. Getting into the first category, power adapters starting at less than 20 watts. The LG 15 watt power adapter is the best one performance wise. From that video though, this is a long off production unit. And the other options are kind of the same. The Insignia 5 watt is the category topper and the 10 watt would be the Samsung. They're all fairly close to each other performance wise, but value wise present a decent option. Many of the smaller adapters don't meet the efficiency standards like the Department of Energy level six standard. This is an efficiency requirement and often these fall short. I'll get into that a little more later on. These devices mostly only support five volts and some of these, the 18 watt adapters, do have a nine volt mode. Moving up in the world, the 18 watt winner, I haven't reviewed yet, but it's been on the list for too long. The ZMI HA711. To move up in power level, we have to learn a little bit more about USB power. To get higher voltages on a USB-A port, the main technology for this is the quick charge protocol or QC. The latest version is QC5, which supports up to unknown voltages and currents. It's a proprietary technology, yay. QC3 is the most popular, which is mostly supported on USB-A ports up to 20 volts and 3 amps, so about 60 watts. The USB PD 3.1 specification has more or less taken over the charging protocol and uses the USB-C port. The non-chip cable version of PD 3.1 goes up to 20 volts and 3 amps. The EMARC standard power range for power delivery 3.1 goes up to 20 volts and 5 amps or 100 watts on a single cable. This is the most common. The newest technology can go beyond this but is over the power range covered in this video. The extended range power adapters are covered in other videos though. I had to draw the line somewhere on this one. Another charging technology is the ability to vary the voltage in order to charge as efficiently as possible for the connected device. Both Quick Charge and USB Power Delivery 3.1 have modes for this. The USB PD version is called PPS, or Programmable Power Supply. This is supported at various power levels by different power adapters. It is sometimes not included in the power of options because it's not required. It's yet another thing to compare. One of the questions I get asked most is, is this power adapter safe to use with my device? The answer is almost always yes. There are two parts to safety. To make it into a recommended device, a device has to carry an electrical safety listing. This is a UL, TUV, ETL, SGS, MET, or similar mark. This is to reduce risk of shock from the AC power. It doesn't mean the device is good, but at least you have a smaller chance of getting electrocuted. The other part of this is safety in terms of if you can use a higher wattage charger with a lower wattage device. In general with USB devices, per the above, the device, not the charger, negotiates any voltage above 5 volts. Also, in general, the device decides how much power to pull from the charger as long as it's less than the maximum the charger is rated for. So nearly all chargers, as long as they have a large enough amount of power, are going to be safe in terms of not damaging the plugged in device. Charging and discharging a battery always causes a little bit of damage. Temperature sometimes is an issue with these chargers. On the larger side of things, I clocked one of these at over 90 degrees Celsius. In general, chargers should not be getting that hot, but temperatures of 60 to 70 degrees Celsius are not unheard of. For 20 watt adapters, the Ugreen CD241 is still the category champion. It has the best efficiency and overall power quality of any other devices, and it is also tiny and lightweight. Oh, and it's also really inexpensive. You get quality and you get it for cheap. It is also among the smallest and lightest in its category. 
The adapter meets all of the efficiency standard requirements and it has 5, 9, and 12 volt fixed output voltage modes and it also has two PPS modes of 6 volts and 11 volts and the latter can do the full 20 watts out. The adapter is relatively safely made. See the teardown video linked in the description. This won't charge your laptops though, so we're going to need a bigger boat. I will have affiliate links to the products too if you want to help the channel out. Okay, to step the power level up a little, we need to learn a few more things. When I test a power adapter, I think of it as a power supply. We end up with a lot of power parameters and where these things are collected are based on some testing standards. Some of the basic terms used in electricity are voltage, current, power, and energy. In DC, these are easy to multiply to get results. In AC, it is more complicated than that since these are moving values and therefore shape and phase become an issue. We have several terms to characterize these values though. Power is the measure of real power used by a power adapter in watts. In an AC voltage system, it is often more complex than just the real power. Power factor is the first term to try and make sense of this complexity. This isn't a lesson on this, just a quick reason for its existence and why you might care. The higher the power factor, the less current is flowing for the same power level. So the goal is to have as close as one of a power factor as possible. Lower current means lower losses. Total harmonic distortion is another factor used, especially the current harmonic distortion. This value is often nonlinear in power adapters, which causes alternate frequencies of current, which cause more losses in electronics. You can have low THD in any power factor, but you can't have high THD and good power factor. These two are related, but not correlated. The next factor, and this is a part of what the Department of Energy and the European Union look at, is the efficiency of the power adapter. This is simply the ratio of the power out to the power in. Nothing is better than an efficiency of one, and higher is better. I sum all this up into a single term called the power quality score. Higher is better. Energy is the power used over time, which is how the unit is often shown. Watts times hours. Or on your electricity bill, kilowatt times hours, or kilowatt hours. The energy is what translates to how much it costs to run a power adapter and what you will actually see on your electric bill. The rate of electricity is cheap, so it takes a fairly significant amount of power over time to make dollars disappear. Here is the U-Green with some various use cases and how much it costs to use in different conditions. For the next category, there are numerous standard sizes, but in general it is going to come down to the size and power options. These power adapters often meet efficiency guidelines, but start to straddle the should or shouldn't it have power factor correction. If you only want one port, the Samsung 45 watt adapters are quite good. With lots of charge modes, these should charge anything you throw at them. The downside is that they are large comparatively to say the Anker Nano 2, which is also a reasonable choice and also expensive. In this power range, you start to get power adapters with more than one port. These will distribute power to either a USB-A or USB-C or two USB-C ports. The dual Apple 35 watt with the ports on the side doesn't make the top of the list or anywhere near it. The top of the 30 watt range is the Google G9BR1LPS, not as good as their MST3K 5 watt adapter. Also, not the smallest adapter, but performance-wise wins the class. The Monoprice 42620 is only a lower voltage device, 5 or 9 volts, so great for two phones or a tablet and a phone or a watch. In terms of pricing in this category, the Samsungs are overpriced for what you get. The Nano 2 30 watt sits in the middle of the price range. Apple for 35 watts is way too expensive and you get poor performance to go with it. The Google adapter sits in a great price range though. This is a tough category, but the next one is even more difficult. The 60 to 66 watt category is where things start to get interesting in terms of performance. Multiple ports and also relatively moderate size and weight for larger games and power output. This is also where the power performance figures on the AC side start to look a little crazy. This means those big spikes in the current wave and not so nice and it ends up costing a little more to operate adapters like this. Like I said, a couple dollars a year may seem like nothing to most people, but multiply that by 100 million power adapters and it isn't zero. In general, as everyone knows, and it is my opinion, this range of power adapters should be avoided if the goal is maximum efficiency grid to phone. The best power adapter in this category, if you can find it in stock, is the Amazon Basics 65 watt single power adapter. It is inexpensive, small, and represents a decent amount of USB charging requirements. This device does lack PPS though. If the size is it, the Anker Nano 2 65 watt is the best option, but you will pay for that compactness. It is expensive, but for that price, you do get some additional charging modes. Overall, this is one of the most available adapters, so you probably will be able to actually get this one. If you need more than one port, the Passius GAN 2 adapter is the current leader. This is nice because you can share the power with a laptop, a watch, and a phone all at once. A little more on that later, why 65 watts might not be enough for this style though. 
The 66 watt category is a bit odd because it lacks a power factor correction feature, which we will soon talk about, and this means they trail behind the leaders. Travel is sometimes the most important bit, and interchangeable adapters of Invisi or Minix and many other clones get an honorable mention. These do sacrifice performance for size and portability, though. I have a separate video on the weird travel adapter things, and more of those on the way, too. Some power adapters try to improve the power factor, the main thing holding back the 65 watt category with something called active power factor correction. I won't be describing the specific mechanism here, but basically we can improve these power statistics and use a little less power for the same output with a correction circuit in place. There is a penalty of idle power consumption though when a circuit is active, so you'll only find these in the larger 100 plus watt power adapters, and not always. The effect is still pretty small on the sample size of one. You know, a 100 watt non-power factor corrected device will cost about three to five US dollars more to operate versus a power factor corrected one in a year. Again, electricity is cheap and the grid still has to pay the price of added current. So PFC is essentially mandatory as things get larger in power levels. 100 watt adapters. This is probably my favorite category. The restrictions of the 65 watt category are gone. Plenty of power for multiple devices opens up more ports and more operating modes. At 100 watts, and you get lots of ports. You can max out the USB PD 3.1 standard and voltage range, so 100 watts, 20 volts, and 5 amps on one port. Or you can share the power with multiple ports and power lots of different devices at the same time. The winner in this category is still Vasius. They have two adapters, a desktop adapter and a wall adapter, and I use both all the time. As mentioned, at the 65 watt level, these adapters get hot. At 100 watts, they get hotter. These step up another level, and people get nervous at how hot they get on the surface. 60 degrees Celsius surface temperatures are not unheard of here. If you figure in getting rid of 10 watts of heat in a tiny plastic case with no airflow, it's no easy task. Cost-wise, the Bassia sits at a very reasonable position. It isn't the cheapest, but to get the premium features and be in the middle of the pricing range, it's a good position to be. Some are way overpriced. For example, the Anchor 100 watt, some are cheap, but they don't make the cut. In terms of modes of operation, the Bassius also is near the top of the list, with PPS modes up to the full 100 watts. After these adapters, we have the Hyphen X, which is the one that surprised me with the most ports and power performance first. A little further on, the tail of two adapters pops in. These are ones that turn power factor correction on or off depending on the mode, and this hurts the overall performance. Though, at 100 watts, some of these may be the best, so the downfall of a single number rating. This is why looking at the details is sometimes better. Some of the 100 watt adapters lack PFC, and they get lower performance numbers. Don't get one lacking PFC, but it is hard to tell what it has and what it doesn't. Manufacturers don't tell you this. I think it might be the only one with that information on the most adapters gathered in one place. In terms of weights and size, these are the biggest and heaviest of the group. I wouldn't quite say luggable, but compared to a 5 watt insignia adapter, you will notice these. Larger power adapters aren't going to be covered in this video, meaning anything larger than 100 watts. I had to draw the line somewhere. The 140 watt comparison video linked in the description covers most things for PD 3.1 devices. But I already have four more in the queue. So as always, new adapters are coming onto the market, so this video is essentially out of date before it is released. I still have to look at that Anchor 30 watt Nano 3 adapter. Okay, so 5 watt Insignia is what you can get now. 10 watt Samsung, 18 watts ZMI, 20 watts Ugreen, 30 watts Google, 45 watts Samsung, 65 watts Amazon Basics, and 100 watts Basius. It seems like every brand is best at a different category. It also seems like each have their advantages. The Ugreen is small and light, but is only for phones. The Basius is very efficient, but is also a bit bulky. Each have different parameters they are good at, but category to category, no one company rules them all. If weight and size are your only concern and you need all the charging modes, the Anchor Nano 2 30 watt is still near the smallest and decent performing for the category. Obviously, as the power increases, the weight increases. Just a note that most adapters featured in this roundup have their own dedicated, more detailed videos. There are still a few missing videos, but if you saw something here and you want the specific video, let me know. If you need portability and multi-country plugability, I recommend a dedicated country adapter to where you are going as opposed to a multi-adapter. That way you can get the best performance and a safe way to connect. The slide-on country-specific plugs for the Minix adapters are a great option though since you get compatibility and compactness. Let me know what you thought of this video. It really is too much to cover in one video, so hopefully I got the general idea out there and you learned what to look for when shopping for power adapters. Focusing on the price, weight, size, performance in each category seemed the best way to go, but leave feedback as always in the comments. 
Also, check the description for links to other videos and affiliate links. I get 1-3%. to Yeah, it's not great, but at least it's not zero if you use the link. Of course, you can always make your own comparisons and find the data online. The easiest way to navigate is the search bar. Thanks for watching. Next week, I'm going to be looking at these Slim Q Barrel Plug USB-C Combo Power Adapters. These should be some unique power adapters for the larger laptops and also accommodating USB PD devices. I have a giant bin of untested things too, so this video will certainly be getting an update in the future.